The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session of, uh, I guess this will be session number eight of uh, the Pixel Point front end and back end uh, orientation for the Pixel Point system. My name is Scott Dunlop. I'm the manager of training and education for PAR Canada, uh, specifically on the PAR Pixel Point system. So hopefully everybody can hear me, everybody can see everything. Uh, can somebody just give me maybe a confirmation within this, the questions box there, just to make sure that I can, you know, you can actually see uh, what's going on on the screen. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So I have confirmation uh, that you are able to see and hear me okay, which is a, a very good thing. And uh, so we'll carry on with where we left off. All right. So uh, last week what we did was we were in the administrator pull-down menu. We went right down to the bottom here. We were in the last selection of this, which was the uh, form designer. And in this we covered all the different things. Uh, that's like a basic orientation in terms of how to go about creating screens, uh, templates and all that kind of stuff and adding in some bells and whistles uh, to each one of your screens and, and so on. Of course, there is a lot more to it than what I just showed you uh, within the two hours we could fit in there, but uh, that gives you some kind of idea of what you can do with it. And just a little reminder as well that if you go into the MyPAR website, uh, you will find actually that there's a whole form designer uh, multimedia window there with all kinds of different videos that kind of cover different applications of the form de designer uh, function. And along with that as well, there is an online course uh, that walks you through basically everything I showed you and then some uh, for form designers. So uh, I highly recommend that. And it's a self-registering thing. It's, uh, it's free as well and, uh, and pretty easy to follow through. And what you can do is you can watch a video or two videos or whatever, and you can pause and you can always log back in and go back into it at your own discretion. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do now, uh, we've pretty well covered off everything within the administrator pull-down menu. So we're going to move across to the next one here, which is table setup. And so within here, we're going to cover things. Of course, this will pertain to basically dine-in type applications and so on. And within here, we'll uh, walk through all the different settings that we have within this. And time permitting as well, we will get into some of the stuff within general setup as well. Okay, so the first thing we have within here is table section setup. So let's just select on this. Now, within table selection setup, this is where you're setting up all of your dining sections for the establishment. All right, I want you to visualize for a moment here. We're maybe at like a, a big entertainment complex or a hotel or something like that that has all types of different dining sections uh, involved within uh, the establishment. And so within here, what you do is you set up each dining section. I know back in the old days, it used to be smoking, non-smoking. That was pretty well it until all the smoking laws came down. Uh, but still, this gives you an idea of the different types of dining sections you can set up with it. Now, if I want to see all the sections that I have, we come down to the navigation bar. And in here, we select on the little flashlight icon, which is search. And in here, it will bring up all of the different dining sections that I've got. And you'll see within this, I've got things such as Bayside, Patio, Poolside, and Terrace. These are the four that I'm going to be working with within this uh, sample presentation here. I should also point out as well that I created this some time ago, and people kind of like it. So I've actually taken uh, the stuff that we're going to be looking at today in terms of the floor layout and so on like that, and I've actually saved it uh, within the education session section of the MyPAR website as well. So if you ever want to do any kind of presentations and so on using these floor layouts, then by all means, uh, feel free to download them off the MyPAR website. Okay, so within here, I've got my dining section set up. In this case, we'll say Bayside is the one that we're looking at right now. Uh, obviously, that's the name of, of the dining section. And then underneath this, we have Revenue Center. A revenue center is a profit center, remember. So like in a hotel, for example, if I had a nightclub and I had a family restaurant and I had a lounge, for example, each one of those would be a different revenue center with its own staff, its own management, its own menu, and so on. And within here, you can have different dining sections assigned to different uh, revenue centers as well. The next thing down here, we have our three little check boxes. And the first one says, enforce employee lockout. Now what this means is that if I open up table number two, in this dining section, then that table belongs to me as Scott the waiter, whereas you, if you tried to get into it, you would not be able to do that as another waiter because that table is reserved to me. Now, if I 
uncheck this box, then what that means is that now it's a free-for-all. Any, any of us can serve anyone at any table at any time. Uh, so you are a waiter, I am a waiter. Table two needs a cup of coffee or a piece of pie or whatever it happens to be. Then either one of us can open up that table and access it and go in and, uh, and serve those, those people. Now, just bear in mind that the last person to have access to that table is the person who currently owns that check. Okay, so for example, you get in, you open up table number two, you take an order and so on. <clears throat> and if I go in as, as another waiter and I pick up table two and I add on a piece of pie, for example, that check is now under my name and I am responsible for it until it comes to the time of, of paying and whoever happens to be the person who processes that payment is the person uh, who will own that check. And when they own that check, that means that uh, they get credit for the sale and uh, also they are responsible for the cash as well. So just bear that in mind. Now if you want to restrict this, which more often than not is the case, then you would just select on this, in which case then you have one waiter working with the whole thing and that's it. Now you can override this as well with security settings. We'll be looking at that later on. Uh, probably not today, but maybe in the next session. Um, and within security settings, if you have high enough security level then for authorization, such as a manager or maybe even a cashier, uh, then you would be able to pick up another person's check and, and do work on it that way as well. But the same rule applies is that the last person who accesses that check is the person who owns it as well. All right, the next thing we have down here is, <clears throat> excuse me, enforce rated item before ordering. This is kind of like a non-loitering, no loitering type uh, function that we have within here. You have, for example, an establishment where you rent things, okay? One of the things that Pixel Point can do is it can process rental items as well, uh, besides just regular food and beverage. And so that being the case, let's say we're at Scott's Bowling Alley, okay? And at Scott's Bowling Alley, we got a nice little snack bar with a grill set up in the back as well. And I make great hamburgers, great hot dogs, and they're really cheap. And um, all the teenagers like to come and eat my really cheap food and just kind of hang out. But the thing is, they're not renting a bowling alley or they're not renting bowling shoes or renting anything like that. And so what I can do is I can actually activate this little thing right here, in which case then if they try to um, order anything and there is not currently a rental of any kind on the check, then the system will not permit this. Okay, so that's what this does. It, that it first checks the contents of the of the order to see if there is a rental residing on it. So they have to, let's say, rent a bowling alley or rent some shoes or something like that. There has to be a rental item on there, which is referred to as a rated item. And if that is the case, then they can place their order at the grill. Uh, but if, if not, like this, uh, on, or the other way around. Uh, if, if it's unchecked, they can they can order anything, and if it is checked, they must have that rental on the order. The next thing we have down here is hide from floor layout. Now, just think back to the floor layout, the front end floor layout. In the top right section, we've got all the dining sections, such as bayside and or smoking, non-smoking, whatever it happens to be. And um, let's say within here, for example, not well. Let's why not bayside? Okay, so we have bayside right now. Uh, Bayside means it's an outdoor dining section, and it is right on the bay, so you can overlook the water, very nice ambiance to uh, have a glass of wine and a salad or something like that. Problem is, it's the middle of January, and so it's kind of cold out there because uh, there's snow all over the place, and uh, no one wants to go sit out on the Bayside patio uh, because of the weather. And so that being the case, there's no point of really having the Bayside dining section actually accessible on the front end. So if that is the case, when winter comes and we close up the Bayside dining section, I can just select on this, and what it will do, it will now remove the title of Bayside off from that list of all the dining sections. So I'll, not, I'll now have just my three other dining sections instead of the fourth uh, being this one, because um, it's, it's the middle of winter and I won't be using this. And then when spring comes, we clean it all up and the snow's all gone and it's a little warmer out and I want to open it up. Then I just go back to this, I uncheck it, and now Bayside is back on the list and accessible for uh, servers to be able to go in and uh, select that dining section and tables within it. And so as you see here, I've got all of my four different dining sections.
Now, this is important that when you are setting up for um, a dine-in type application where there is more than one dining section, you do actually have something set up within here as well. That's very important uh, because as we get into one of the next sections, not necessarily the, the immediate one, but the next one after that, uh, then it will be important that you've got your dining sections already set up. All right, coming back to table setup, the next thing we have here is table settings. Now, table settings <clears throat> shows you in kind of like a database format all of the different uh, database table records uh, that are in there. So you see, for example, we've got table one, so there's record number one, number two, number three, and so on. And within here, there's about 150 uh, that are already set up within the system by default. If there are more than, more than 150 tables or if you need some form of numeric um, setup, where you need something like a 100 series and 200 series and a 300 series or anything like that, then by all means you can add in additional ones as well. But uh, within here, uh, these are the ones that we have within here by default. Now, uh, that being said, let's just take a look at what we've got here. So we've got ta uh, tables one, two, and three, for example. Number of customers. Now in here, each one of these is set up as two, which means that this is these are set up as two seater tables. Okay, so the way I've got my uh, database set up right now, because I've already gone and modified these for my given uh, floor layout, is that all these are set up as two seaters, and then from table 11 on are four seaters and so on. The next thing we have here is the dining section. So all of these are designated for poolside, for example. Now, the dining section is also important when you are setting up, if you remember back to when we had the host hostess function within the front end. I was showing you how to seat people at tables and take reservations and deal with a lineup at the door and so on. That was in, a, in one of our earlier sessions. And in here, this is where you can actually designate that if they want to seat uh, people at table number three, that will be a table for two, and it's in the pool side dining section. And if I wanted to change it to one of the other ones, just select on that field, and there's a little drop down box, and you can change it to any of the uh, other dining sections if you wish. Next thing we have here is minimum and maximum seating capacity. This is important because uh, within this, um, uh, when you're seating people, let's say for example, there may be one person and you seat them at a two-person table, or three people seated at a four-seater table, um, or you may want to, you know, combine a couple of tables together so that uh, you can deal with a party of 12 or something like that. Then within here you want to ensure as far as what is the maximum capacity of this. So for example, if I have a four-seater table and I want to try to fit a fifth person, you may be able to do that so you can change that to a five. But if it's six people, no, you wouldn't be doing that so you'd never have six people seated at a four-seater table. Can reserve. Within can reserve, uh, basically, when you're taking reservations, do you want this table number to show up on the list? Uh, within this, you can change it to a yes or a no. Generally, you would have yes, and you're thinking, well, why would I not want to be able to reserve a table? Well, the reason being is that sometimes if you have an entire establishment set up so that uh, you that does a lot of reservations, if you have it set up so that every table can be, be reserved, then you may find yourself in a situation where uh, let's say 7 o'clock on a Friday night and a party of four comes in and they say, I'd like a table for four. And you take a look and holy mackerel, even though we've got some empty tables here, we've got reservations for every table in the establishment. And so now these people are kind of stuck. You, you can't service these people because you've got reservations parked for every one of the tables in the establishment. So it's always a good idea just to have maybe one or two tables that are uh, set up as cannot be reserved especially for places that do a lot of reservations, just so they can deal with some walk-in traffic and be able to accommodate them in situations such as that. And finally, we have here sales type. Use the, the station default. Okay, Now, the sale type, you can set up for these as well. Generally, it's dine-in for this. But for example, it may be a bar stool. You want to change uh, the sale type on that to something a little bit differently, or, or maybe a, a, a kind of a parking holding table, for example, for takeout orders or something like that. Whatever the case, then uh, you can change that around to a specific sale type just by selecting on that and choosing the desired sale type for it. But by default, they will all be whatever is set up for the station default for that. Okay? So that's generally what it is for those. Now, on a record by record basis, you can go in here and you can change these around. But I'm actually going to show you within other things we're going to take a look at a much easier way to deal with this and make these changes rather than go in here and do this. This is really good if you're going to do it on a per record basis. But otherwise, you may want to uh, consider changing around to something else. I'll show you how to do that. 
the next thing we have down here is table layout setup. Now this is where you are setting up your table layout screen. Now, take a look at what I've got up on the screen right now. That is probably not what you normally see on your screen. Okay, I'm just going to come up to the top here, and I'm going to go to display background. Okay, this is probably more like what you actually see on your screen right now. And what this is is basically the, the, the default setting for the table layout screen. I'm going to show you how to pretty it up and, and do all kinds of funky stuff with it. But we're going to start with here with this blank screen. Now before we get into any of the controls up at the top, let's first take a look down at the table section down below. And you'll see down here, for example, I've got a couple of things. First of all, uh, I have these gray lines that show up here. Now what these are, these are guidelines. Okay? They will not show up within the front end, but they do show up within here. And they are to help guide you through uh, the screen display. To, uh, so that you can have some idea in terms of, of uh, the dimensions that you're working with on this. Now, if I come up to this uh, top thing where it says layout settings, and then within here, I'm going to go out to layout resolution. You'll see within here right now, it's set up for 1024 by 768. Now, my laptop screen, and I apologize for this, I forgot to set it to a 1024 display, and really I need to do that. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I won't mess anything up when I do it. But because I, I do want to show you how it, it properly looks within here. Well, no, maybe I'll just leave it. I'm not going to mess around with things. Uh, in here, we have a 1024 by 768 uh, display, which means all of the stuff that you want to do for a single dining section for a 1024 resolution would fit within those lines there. That would be one dining section and another dining section here. And if I scroll down a little bit, then oh, then you'll see that I've got another line here, and these are other dining sections as well. One, two, three, four, and there are many more uh, that can be applied to this as well. And you're not certainly not restricted to four within this. Uh, but if I come to this and change layout resolution, let's say to an 800 by 600, for example, you'll see now I've got much smaller uh, areas here. So there's an 800 by 600, 800 by 600, and so on for each one of those. In this, I'm just going to set this back to 1024. Also, if you're working with something other than that, then you can set up and you can define the resolution here. And also, if you want to just remove those lines altogether, you don't you don't need them or whatever the case, then you can just select on that, in which case then they'll, they will, when I select on OK, they will disappear from the screen. But we'll leave them as they are right now. <clears throat> OK, so now coming up <clears throat> to the top left corner, what we're going to do here is we're going to start playing around with some of these controls here. And the first thing I have is this, uh, this thing here that says table, and it's got a circle above it. So basically, there are three shapes of tables that you can apply to the floor layout screen. The first one being a round table, the second one being a square table, and the third one being a diamond-shaped table. Now, to add a table to the system, we just select on the desired one and do a click and drag down to the, the dining section. Now, you'll notice that when I let go of my button, it now comes up with a keypad, and on here it's asking for a table number. Now remember, I've got 150 tables in there by default. It's now prepared to add on additional tables if I want. In this case, I'm going to work with those existing records. So to do that, I'm going to change this from a 152 to a 1, which means I'm going to work with the first uh, table record within the, uh, within the screen that we looked at earlier on. And so I'm going to click on OK, and there we go. So I now have table 1 showing up on the screen right now, and it's a circle table. I'm going to do another table. This time I'll do a square one. I'll do a click and drag down. And notice now it automatically increments up to two. And it'll go three, four, five, and so on. And we'll do table three. All right, so here we have our three tables in my dining section right now. A, a circle, a square, and a diamond-shaped table. Now, within these, what you can do is you can use these guides right here if you want to kind of use a standardized set for these. By default, these are considered large tables right now. So if I wanted to, for example, change the size of one of these tables, so just select on it, it now highlights in yellow, and then from here I can change it from large to a medium. And here I can select on this one and change it to a regular. Okay, so you'll see we've got different sizes now that you can play with on these. And uh, from there, you can apply them onto the screen that way. Now, I'm looking at table three, for example, and right now, well, that's kind of small. Really, I want a bigger table than this, and I want to play around with it a little bit and make it a little bigger. Now, in choosing this, and it's now highlighted in yellow, you'll notice up to the upper left of that icon, I have this little uh, square that shows up in there. And this is actually for you to place your, your mouse pointer right on it. And then if I do a click, 
You'll notice now as I'm holding down my button, my icon or my uh, pointer now changes to a diagonal icon. And then from here, I can do a, a drag. So it's a click and drag. And from here, I can make that table as big as I want. All right, so coming back to number two. All right, so there's a, a little square table right now. And I don't want a square table. I don't want a rectangle table. So I just do a click. Ooh, let's try that again. Got to get right on there. And then drag it up like this. And there's a nice long table. And as far as my circle one, you can play around with that as well. So here I've got my three tables, and I've just made them bigger and kind of played around with the size on them as well. Okay, the next thing we have here are all these patterns. Now, actually, I'm going to bypass these patterns and come back to them uh, shortly because these are all related to these three icons right up here. And this is a rounded square, a circle, and a square. Now, these are actually objects that you can apply onto the system. So on here, for example, if I want to put, let's say, a rug underneath these, then I'm going to make uh, a rug out of the rounded square, for example. So I'll select on that. And now with the button pressed, I can come down here and do a click and drag. And there's my big rug that's going to go underneath these tables. Now, the problem is I just threw the rug over top of the tables. And so as you can see now, I've got a big blue rug. Uh, sitting on top of these tables, which I can't access now, can't do anything with it. So um, within this, again, I'll come back to these later, but within this, what I can do now is I can actually change around a few things with this rug. The first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the color of it. So if I come over to this, you'll see I come up with a color palette, and from here I can choose a different color. But I'm not actually highlighted on that yet, so the first thing you want to do is be able to select that. To do it, Select on Edit, make sure that's pressed down, and then choose the item. Okay, so now it's in big yellow, and there's there's my uh, my table. And of course, in the upper left, there's the little icon there, so I can change around the shape of it again as well if I wish. Now, having selected that, I can now go into this, and I'll say, for example, I'm going to make this kind of like a, a light yellow table. Okay, or a light yellow rug. So here we have this light yellow rug now that's showing up within there, very pretty, but still sitting over on top of the tables. Now I still have edit selected, so if I choose it once again, this time I can come over to these icons, which is bring to front and send to back, which allows you to layer things. In this case, I'm going to send this rug to the back of the display. And in doing that, I now have my tables showing up over top of it. And then when I just unselect it, there we go. So I've got my yellow rug sitting underneath three blue tables, uh, which is tables one, two, and three. The tables are always blue. Uh, the reason being is because they're color-coded at the front end, remember, okay, where we've got blue tables are available, red tables are selected, and you're working on them. And kind of like a gold or a yellow table uh, means that uh, it's being used by another server. And uh, so that's why they're always blue, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. I should also point out as well, because we're working with a, a database record, for each one of these tables. You cannot set them up as an alphanumeric table. They must be numeric all the time. Now, that being said, if you want a table A2, for example, you can't do that. But what you can do is if you are working with tables that you want to kind of differentiate them a little bit, then as I had mentioned earlier on, you, you don't have to go through 1 through 150. You can actually go 100 series of table, 200 series of table, 300 series of table, and so on. Uh, so you can, you can change the numbers on them. Uh, to reflect different dining sections that way, uh, if you wish. All right, so uh, within here, I've shown you how to create an object, and you can use any one of these things. Now, also within here, we have a couple of other icons as well. We have the, uh, the text icon, and we also have a line icon as well. So the line icon, pretty straightforward. I select on this, and I want to draw a line, and there we go. Okay, so you can just draw individual lines that way. Now. The next thing we have here is the text. If I want to throw some kind of a title on it, for example, like the dining section it may represent, I can select on this, and then when I come down to the, uh, the dining section, I just click on where I want the text to start. And I select on that. And here I come up with this text string, and then here I will say Scott's dining section. Oh, I'm a little limited in my 
in my text I can put in there. But we have something like that, and there is Scott's dining section on this. Now, be careful here, because I still have this selected. If I choose to select anywhere, click anywhere else on the screen right now while this is pressed down, then it's going to ask for another text string. And then you're going to find the word text string all over your, your, uh, your floor layout. You really don't want to do that. So make sure you just select on anything else to get it off that, to unselect that, uh, in order to bring it back to what it was. Now, you'll see within here, I now have, for example, Scott's dining section, and it's, it, it's kind of small and kind of looks a little cheesy and so on. We can actually fix that up as, as well. There's a lot we can uh, with, do with these, these things. And one of the things so we can do here, for example, is we can come up to where we have layout font. Okay, and font, and uh, yeah, we'll go with the layout font. Okay, so in here, when I select on this, this pertains to all the text that shows up within the floor layout screen. And right now, it's uh, in a Microsoft uh, sans serif and uh, regular size and eight font on this. And if I want, for example, I'll change it to something like uh, Mahara, for example. I'll make it bold and bleak, and we'll beef it up to maybe a size 16, or uh, maybe 24. OK, and so we'll go with something like that. And you see now, the text on it has changed considerably from what it was before. And, and so you can really beef it up that way as well. All right. Um, now, getting back to these, uh, all these little shapes and, and things like that. <coughs> so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose my rug again. Instead of uh, it being like a, a carpet, let's say we want to give it some kind of a pattern to it. Then I can actually go into this, and I can choose maybe like a, a crisscross pattern. So that it's still yellow, but it's in a crisscross pattern. Here, maybe I can change this to green, see if that uh, helps any. Ooh, we got to choose it first. There we go. I'll actually, choose a darker green too. There we go. And so now we have our tables on this uh, this rug that has kind of a green crisscross on it. Or if you're doing something like maybe like an indoor patio and you want to do like a miter cut, you know, wood pattern or something like that. Then again, we can uh, choose on this. You know, change the pattern to something, and uh, you know, you can change around the, the the pattern that way. So that's basically what that represents is all that kind of stuff. And of course, you can make this look beautiful, or you can make it look but ugly, depending on your level of artistic talent with all this stuff. Now, one more thing I'm going to show you within this, uh, this thing is this uh, last thing right here, which is snap to grid. OK, now when you're taking a look, for example, I'm going to move table number two here. And I'm going to reposition it around. And take a look at this. You'll notice it's a little bit choppy as I move it. And the reason being is that there's actually a built-in grid inside this. And the purpose of this grid is to help you line things up properly. But you may want to position something just a little between the grid, so we, for example. And so, excuse me. <sighs> Sorry about that, folks. All right, so in here, if I want to change around how this appears, like this, and, and position it just in the right spot, then I can unselect Snap to Grid, in which case now when I move it around, it's very smooth, and I can be very precise in terms of where I want to position it. And there you go. Okay, So you can be very specific on that. All right, let's come up to the pull-down menus across the top and see what other stuff we can do here. First of all, I'm going to start way over on the right here. We've got Layout Settings. So as I did, Earlier, I showed you layout font where we can change around the font that shows up with all the text on the on the floor layout screen. We also have floor color. The way this looks right now, if I was to put this on my system and, and present it on the POS, it would show up with a white background with this kind of green miter cut rug on here and so on. And what I can do is actually give some color to the floor. By selecting on this, I again come up with my color palette. And then from within here, I can choose a color. And there we go. Yes, it's ugly, but yes, you can do it. And so in here, you can change around the floor color by doing that. I'm going to make it something a little more subtle. OK, so there's, there's a gray, for example, on there. Now, one thing I should point out as well, when you do uh, go into uh, the floor color, or any of the other any other time that you come up with this color palette, you do have this thing that says define custom colors. And from here, you can get into a very exact uh, color scheme for this. Just bear in mind, though, that when you're working with different machines, sometimes the resolution and the settings uh, for the RGB codes, red, green, blue, uh, they might be just a little bit different, and the shades might appear a little bit different between them as well. If you go with the basic colors, 
within here, they will always be, you know, pink will be pink and red will be red and orange will be orange. Uh, but if you work with the the, uh, the custom ones, you, I can't guarantee that you're going to get an exact match up with the shades every time. So just kind of bear that in mind as well. Okay, the next thing we have down here is a layout resolution, as I showed you earlier and explained all that. And then underneath that, we have display background. Now, display background shows me something a lot more nicer looking than a plain old uh, background. And as you see here, I've got this uh, nifty little floor layout that's uh, showing up in here. So let's talk about how to get something like that on there. Um, what you're looking at right now, actually, I'll tell you what here. Let's start with a, a whole new layout. Well, here, I'll just exit it here. No, and I'll just go back in again. Where am I? There we go. Okay, so here we are right now with this nifty little floor layout image that's showing up on here. Now, what you're looking at actually is just a. I was just when I was learning the system because, of course, I have to learn everything that I'm teaching as well. So, uh, when you're going through and kind of taking a look at all the different things that you can do on the on the system, one of the things I was doing was I was trying to create my own floor layout screen, and on here. Um, I was I think I had PowerPoint up on, on the screen at the time and so what I did was I just created a bunch of uh, screen layouts floor layouts uh, within PowerPoint you can use any form of graphic package of any kind uh, that you wish and uh, to create the, these things including photographs as well what you're looking at right now is actually uh, an image um, that I created. Each one of these uh, images here actually was a separate one I created. Then I just kind of tuck them all together. And each one is given a, a screen display of 1024 by 768 And uh, when I design these things. And all I did was basically, for example, this, this, uh, this kind of like a gravel type uh, floor here for around the pool, for example. Uh, what I did was I just created a big box and I filled it in with an image that I, I just pulled off the internet. Okay, you can go in and find little, you know, patterns of different things and so on. And I just filled it with that. And then all these uh, little shrubs that I have here, for example, these are just uh, clip art images that uh, I pulled off again from PowerPoint, and then just uh, filled them up with uh, other image with other patterns that I pulled off the internet, like uh, like bushes or grass or something like that. Uh, this is a, a water one that I found on the internet, this is a marble one, and so on like that. So these are just patterns that I pulled off the internet. And then from here I created all these different shapes and, and, and clip art items and so on. And I just kind of filled them in with stuff and I came up with something a little, little pretty, you know, not too bad, and, uh, to come up with all these different things. And I, <coughs> excuse me, I set each one of these up with 1024 by 768, as I said here. And this particular one has four of these dining sections. So there's my pool side, there's my terrace, and a couple other dining sections down below. And so now, after I, I had created all of those, and I came up with my one master image, kind of think of this like a, a Windows desktop wallpaper type type thing, is I saved it all in my Pixel POS folder. And I gave it the name floorlayout.jpg. Okay, so it's a JPEG file. And the name of the JPEG file is floor layout, one word. F L O O R L A Y O U T. Okay, that is the name of the file. Now, Pixel Point will actually look for that file within uh, the folder, and if it does have it in there, it will automatically apply it to the system. Uh, so that being said, all you have to do is just rename it to that, and it's sitting in the Pixel POS folder. Boom! There's your back, back, uh, your background for the system. Now, what's really clever about this. Okay, this is kind of a for the salespeople now. Not only does pretty sell, but you're going to find like when you're trying to sell Pixel Point, for example, that a lot of people, they come up with their point of sale systems and they have dazzling looking floor layouts. But the rest of the point of sale system is a piece of crap. And the reason being is that they focus so much on making it pretty to sell it rather than the functionality of the system. Now, Pixel Point, we were able to come up with a better solution. And because what happens quite often is they'll come up with all of these different little tools that you can throw on to the background to make it look pretty. Like if I want a staircase, if I want a bar, if I want a, a swimming pool or something like that. They would actually have to create all these graphic images to do that. And every time 
a server comes back to the table layout screen, it has to regenerate all of these objects as well, and it slows down the performance of the system. You don't want that with your pixel point system. So what we did was basically said, you know what, the background is not important to the functionality of the system. It looks pretty, it helps with orientation of where you're dealing with on the floor layout, but it's just a picture. So that being said, we used Windows Approach for <laughs> wallpaper and did the same thing, where the floor layout uh, JPEG file is just a piece of a wallpaper that just sits in the background, and then you're actually laying your table template on top of that. This is why right now I don't have a, te a template loaded up on the screen, but I've got this big picture showing up with all the dining sections and so on, is because I haven't actually applied my floor layout on top of it. Just think of it as a transparency with all your functional tables, and you're laying it right over top. That's what this does. Now, within here, I actually did create a floor layout to match up with all of this. And if I come up to File, and I come down to Load Layout, you'll see within here, I'm brought into my Pixel POS folder, and I just kind of scroll down. And it's looking for anything with an FLR extension. That's a floor layout extension. Now, right now, you're probably working with the standard one that comes with the blank database, and that won't really match up with this, this image. But I did actually create one as well, and this is included within the download off the MyPart website of Demo Floor Section 1024. Uh, this is one that I create, one that I created to match up with my, my image that I created. And so I'll select on OK, or Open. And here now, I have all of my uh, tables applied <coughs> excuse me, to each one of the dining sections. <coughs> Sorry about that. OK. So within here, for example, I have this dining section with the swimming pool. And as you can see, I've got tables 1 through 5, 6 through 10, 11 through 14 that I created within here. And they're all circle tables, and all of these I created in a slightly different size. So these ones are larger, and these ones are smaller. Now, also within here as well, I may want to change around the seating capacity on these. Because remember, within the front end, when it shows up a table, it will have these little nodules that show up off of the sides of it, identifying seats, where you've got two seaters, four seaters, and so on like that. And so in here, if I wanted to make uh, these tables for example, two seaters. You could go into that previous section I showed you for the table settings, and then there, say, tables one through five, we'll have a two, 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 just modify each one of those records. An easier way to do this is actually by tagging the tables. I'm going to show you how to tag a table. So tagging means that I want to apply a common change to all of these tables. Now, I've, what I've done here is I've done my click and drag, I brought them all down, and I stuck them in exactly the spot I wanted. Now what I want to do is make a common change to each one of these. So I go to the table number one, and on my, my keyboard, I hold down the control key, and then I go click. I come down to table number two, still holding down the control key, click. And table three, click. So what I've done now is I, by holding down the control key, I can make multiple selections, just like Windows. And then within here, if I right click on it, on any one of them, I come up with this little uh, tag menu. And on here, I can make a common change to all of these items. Now, let's just take a look at some of the changes I can make to this. First of all, we've got table information. Now, on here, just don't really worry so much about that. The table information is the stats that show up on it in terms of the minimum, maximum, so on like that. But down below are some other things that we can actually change on this. For example, change the table number. Remember I was talking about the 100, 200, 300 series? <coughs> so in here, you choose as far as the, the first number uh, that would show up in here in, in case, you know, on table 1, I could change it to 100. And it'll be 101, uh, 101, 102, 103, for example. That kind of thing. So this is where you can make changes to the table numbers that way. Also, change the number of seats as well. Uh, right now, if they're set at 4 and I want to change them to a 2, or 2, I want to change to a 4, something like that, you can select on this keypad will come up and you identify what the seating, uh, how many seats are at that table, or all of those tables. Change the table type. Okay, the table type right now is a circle, and I can change it to a square or a diamond. Change the table section. This is really nifty here. When you're setting up different dining sections, for example, I can select on this, and it will come up with my list of all the different dining sections. And from here, I can choose pool side. 
and change the sail type as well. So within here, by default, whatever is set up for the station there in terms of it being a dine-in or a patio or a takeout or whatever, uh, you can change the sail type for these given tables as well. Now down below that, I also have a couple of things here I can do. Align left side and align top sides. Now what this will do is that, uh, for example, when I'm trying to line up my tables just right, it will look for the table that is furthest to the left on the screen and it will line up all of the other tables that you selected with that left alignment. So that way they will all be in a straight column. And if I'm trying to put them all across this way, then I can say align top sides, in which case then, whichever one is furthest to, to the top of the screen, then it will line up all of those so that they are at, at the same uh, horizontal uh, level as well. So that's what you can do when you're tagging tables, is just make a common change like that. And again, to do that, just hold down the control key and click on them as you, as you go through each one of those tables. Now, I'll come down to other things within here in a moment, but let's uh, first finish off what we've got here. So I've got my display background showing up. I've gone through all of these. Next, we have over here, edit object. Now, remember an object is an item uh, like a, the rounded square, the rug that I created, for example, or the circle or a square or something like that. And if you want to do any further work with these, for example, uh, let's say I, I want to have several bars that I've created or several of these bushes. Actually, I did that with these. Uh, this, well, no, not necessarily with this one because, of course, this was within an image. But let's say I, I did a, I created something here. Okay, here's, there's, a, there's an object I, I create on the screen. And I want to use that, let's say, multiple times within the system. Then what I can do is I can actually edit and select on that so it's highlighted. And then within here I can go into Edit Object and I can duplicate object, for example. And now I have two of them exactly the same size and you can continue doing that. If for any reason I want to remove one, then I just select on Highlight It, and then Edit and Remove Object. And it's taken off the thing. And this also applies to text on there as well. Now this is text that I applied within the image, but if there was the, you know, the Scott's Dining section, for example, like that, then I can actually remove that from here as well uh, using Edit Object. Okay, now coming back to File. Okay, so new layout, I want to create a whole new layout, pretty self-explanatory. Load an existing layout, I just did, and that shows you what you can do. Uh, save the layout, so if I've given it an, uh, a name, then I can save it and just update it that way. Or save as and save it as a different name, so that's all pretty straightforward stuff. Now, down below here, we have a couple of other things as well. Print layout section and open print editor. Now, let's talk about print layout section. <clears throat> now, thinking back to when I talked about host hostess, remember that where you're a person and you're at the front entrance and you're seating people and dealing with the lineup and so on like that. And I showed you the application of host hostess, but that means that you have to have a station set up there in order to manage all these people. Now, we go to the establishment and they say, well, you know what, that, that is really great and I would love to do that, but I just don't have the budget for it right now. Uh, so, you know, I just have this this table and I've got... Uh, you know, a, a drawing of my my, uh, my floor layout from here. They just use a marker and they say who's going to be seated where, and they and they highlight it, and and I just let them work with the manual system that way. Well, that's that's fine and dandy, and and quite often you see that at many places, and they'll have this cheesy looking drawing of the floor layout. It would be nice though if they had something a little more professional looking, a little nicer, and a little more accurate uh, in terms of the floor layout. Well, we actually have a middle road that you can do within that, and that is print layout section. Now, in here, if I want to do, uh, let, let's say I wanted the person, they are working with you know, the manual system, but it'd be nice if the point of sale system could actually provide me with a drawing of that instead of them having to do it you know, with a crayon and a piece of paper. And actually, you can do that with Pixel Point. You go into print layout section. Now in here, it's going to come up with all the different dining sections, and in here I'm going to say, for example, poolside. So I'm going to select on that, and I'm going to provide them with a nice printed layout of that. Oh, okay, yes, it already exists. There we go. Okay, because I've already done this before. Okay, so here is now um, basically a cropped image of the uh, dining section for the swimming pool area. And you'll see within here, it's basically exactly the same as what we just looked at on the floor layout screen. But take a look. I'm actually down in that next section, which is the print editor. 
And uh, from here, I can now make some, some changes to this as well, or I can just print it off as it is. But let's say, <clears throat> for example, I wanted to make some changes to it. All right, so what are some of the changes we can do? Well, I mean, basically, it's pretty straightforward stuff here, but I'll kind of give you an idea of some of the things we can play around with. First of all, I've got here fill. Okay, now everything shows up in blue right now, and it looks pretty, pretty decent. But for some reason, I want to maybe change the color of some of these tables. Uh, so what I can do is I'm going to, to uh, fill. And on this as well, I guess I'm going to need to uh, choose some kind of a, a color as well. You'll see right now it shows up as a white, and uh, maybe I'll come up here. I'll make them kind of like a, a yellow. Okay, and now I'll come down here, and I've got my, my uh, little icon showing up like that. And I'll say, for example, tables 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are now, now all showing up in yellow. Uh, now I can change the color maybe to, I don't know, we've got blue. Let's do pink. And over here I'll do pink, 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 and pink. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here is just a, a drawing type application, kind of like paint and so like that, where I've actually filled in different colors of these things. If you have a color printer, this looks really nifty. And from here, now what's the whole point of doing this? Well, what I can do is actually I can say, for example, that I want to uh, allocate these tables to different servers. Okay, so what servers do we want to do? Well, let's uh, just throw in now uh, a label on this. So I'll select on label and label font. Okay, so we'll do, for example, we'll, you know, we'll just choose. We got all kinds of stuff here. No, that's that's kind of ugly. Okay, there we go. Just something and right now we'll do bold. Okay, and we'll make it a size 14. And now from here, I've got pink tables and I've got yellow tables. And over here, I'm going to say, for example, I'm choose on this. And in my print string, I will say. Sue's tables. And so there's Sue's tables. And over here, Sam's tables. And so now what I've done here is I've actually done a little bit of editing on this floor layout uh, where it shows accurately as it shows up on the point of sale system. But also within this as well, I've allocated out pink tables being Sue's, yellow tables being Sam's. Isn't that nice and pretty? And then from all this now, I can <clears throat> go about uh, printing this off. I can also save this as well. So if normally on a Tuesday night, I have Sue and Sam working, and they're working their, these tables in this dining section, I can just save this on the system, bring it up, and boom, just print it off, and you're ready to go. All right, and I'm going to exit on that. Save changes, no. We'll leave that as it is. And now I'm back to the table layout screen again. All right, so that's everything that you can do within print layout and then open print editor as well, which brings that up, and I can I can load that up. Okay, now one more thing that I'm going to show you before we're finished with this as well, <coughs> and that is how do I make this dining section that I created here? How do I identify that as poolside? Because if I save it as it is right now, and I go into the front end, and I've got my dining sections, and I select poolside, it doesn't take me anywhere. If I select on terrace, it doesn't take me anywhere. The reason being is that we need to now tag each one of these dining sections to its appropriate dining section, okay? So that when I choose poolside, it's actually going to bring me to this section of the screen. To do that, what you do is you go to the center of that dining section and you double click. And what we have here is a window that says create section marker four. And in here I have a list of all the dining sections that I've created. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to match up each one of these sections on, on the, the layout with the appropriate dining section. So in this case, this would be poolside. So I select on that, OK. And now, when I select on poolside within the front end, it will take me to this section of the layout right here. And if I choose on the terrace, it will take me to that one, and so on. All right, so that's how you go about uh, playing around with the uh, floor layout screen, how you can create all kinds of different little things with it as well. Okay, now the next thing we have down here is table drawing. Pretty simple stuff here. Within table drawing, you have a choice between two-dimensional, which was the older versions of Pixel Point. We used to be just two-dimensional tables that showed up. And then around version eight or nine, we came up with three-dimensional tables, a little more nicer looking. Uh, so then you can change them over to that. And so when I go into the table layout screen at the front end, they will show up in, in either two-dimensional layout or three-dimensional layout. And of course, by default, the one we all kind of like is the 
3D with shadow. Now, if you're really restricted on uh, memory usage, okay, so I've got an older machine, it's got just a little bit of RAM, I'm trying to cut down all the bells and whistles and make it as simple as possible. You may want to take it off the 3D with shadow and knock it back maybe to a 2D, two-dimensional uh, display, in which case then that will save just a little bit of, of RAM on there as well, especially if you've got a lot of tables on there. Now the last thing we have within here is reservations, and we put it under table setup because uh, you can take if you're taking reservations, you're going to be reserving a table generally. Uh, so if that that being the case, you can do it right from here. Now we have reservation capability at the front end in a couple of areas. You may recall that if you go into manager functions, uh, you can actually select uh, reservations within there. Also, if you go into the table. Uh, layout or the table management screen host hostess function obviously there is reservation capability within there as well where you can take a reservation but let's say you're a manager you're sitting in the back office you're working on the system the place isn't open yet and someone calls up and said I'd like to take a reservation rather than going to the front end to do it you can actually do it from back office as well you just go into here and reservations <coughs> and within here I'm in the reservation screen I can go in and add a reservation and come up with this whole, whole process, which I've already shown you. And you can walk through and take a reservation directly from the back office. And that's how you can do that. All right, so that's everything under table setup. And uh, I think we've covered that off pretty good. What I'm going to do right now, I know we're a little bit early, but we're doing, doing good for time, is um, maybe because everything's kind of working today, is uh, we're going to take just a five-minute break and uh, give you a chance to get up and uh, go to the bathroom and have a, have a smoke or whatever it is you, you might want to do. And uh, we'll come back in five minutes, and then we'll continue off with the second half of this presentation, in which case we'll start getting into some of the things within the general setup screen. Okay, so uh, just relax and uh, take five minutes for a break, and I'll see you shortly.
Okay, hello everyone, and uh, just to make sure everything's working okay. All right, we're going to bring up questions again, and uh, can just something confirm with me that uh, you can actually see uh, everything looking okay, and you can hear me all right. Yes and yes. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Okay, good. We're good. Thank you very much, folks. All right, so let's continue on where we left off. <clears throat> so having finished everything within the table setup uh, pull-down menu, let's move over now to the next one, which is general setup. Now within here, all of the settings in here are basically just general applications within uh, the Pixel Point system. Okay, So administrator is like all the techie type stuff for hardware and so on. Table setup, everything pertaining to table related things, as, as you saw here. And now we're into general setup, which is just kind of miscellaneous things that uh, kind of we need to fill in the holes. And so the first thing we have here is coupon setup. So coupon is basically anything discount related. So I'm going to select on this. So when we do actually want to pr provide some kind of a discount, then we use coupons. And if it's a physical coupon or kind of like a calculated coupon or whatever it happens to be, then we all we lump it all into this one being coupon setup. Now in here, for example, I've got a sample one that I've created here, which is 10% off. And what we're going to do here is walk through all of these different fields, and I'll explain all of the guts that are in here and how to go about creating coupons on the system or discounts. Okay, so the first thing we have here, for example, is description. Okay, and here I put in, for example, 10% off. Uh, so whatever the name of the discount is going to be, that's what you type within there. The next one down here is security level. Now I can ap apply a security level to an individual uh, discount on the system. So for example, I've got all of these high school kids who are working in my establishment, and I do not want them to be able to provide a 100% off discount. That's something reserved for a manager, so that if they need to comp something, then you can do that. Uh, but I can't allow them to, you know, for whatever reason, and it can be completely legit that, you know, a person may bring in a coupon or something like that for 10% off or whatever the case. They should be able to process that. So in here, I can actually put in a security level to identify uh, who can actually process this without manager authorization. That's not to say that a 16-year-old server couldn't have a 100% off discount applied to one of their checks, but it would be one that is authorized by a legitimate manager in order to do that. The next thing we have down here is revenue center. Again, if you're working with different profit centers or revenue centers, then you can identify certain coupons and discounts applicable to certain uh, areas within the, uh, the overall establishment as well, and you can do that by revenue center. The next thing we have here is maximum coupon amount. Okay, now, what this does, it allows me to set kind of a, a, a ceiling limit on what you can discount uh, using this particular coupon. Prime example here, um, I have an extensive selection of wines in my establishment. I've got like about 200 bottles of wine, and they average anywhere from 40 to $80 for a bottle of wine. And on here, I put in this 10% uh, off uh, coupon and you can apply this to any bottle of wine in my establishment, which is no problem there, and I've already figured it out, and okay, I can live with that. Uh, the problem is I forgot that I've also got a couple of really high-end vintage bottles of, of wine that I kind of keep in my cellar, and um, they're like about maybe $1,000 a bottle, for example. And uh, so somebody comes in, they sit down, and they say, I would like that $1,000 bottle of wine. Oh, and here's my 10% off discount as well. And you're just pulling your, your hair out because you think, oh, I forgot about that. And so now they are entitled to 10% off a $1,000 bottle of wine. So they basically saved 100 bucks uh, on that purchase uh, using that. And that's something you did not take into account. So if that is the case, what you can do is within here, the maximum coupon amount, I can say, for example, up to a value of, let's say, $40 or something like that. So what you can do then is, regardless of what the calculation is, it will, it will put a ceiling on it so that, you know, yeah, I'll take 10% off or 50% off or 100% off, but up to a, a maximum value of whatever amount you put within this field here. So very helpful that way. All right, coming down below that, we have type of coupon. We have four different types that we can apply within here. The first one shows as percent off. 
Now, in doing that, obviously, it's going to be 10% off, 15% off, 5% off, whatever it happens to be. It'll be a percentage calculation. Underneath that, we have amount off. So that'll be like a $2 discount or a $5 discount or a $10 discount. Fixed price. Whatever the price of the item or group of items is, I'm going to say it's, it's going to be $9.99. So for any large pizza, $9.99. Okay, that's very typical something like that. So whatever you apply this discount to, regardless of what the, the actual price of the item is, bring it down to a fixed price of, boom, whatever you put within there. And also we have manually entered as well, which means that when you are applying this, the system will actually bring up a keypad and prompt you what is the dollar value that you are discounting off this particular item or items. And so that's how that's handled there. So when you're doing things, for example, like a manager comp, all right, the, today uh, the, this customer said the lasagna tasted bad or the spaghetti was cold or something like that. You can choose on the individual item and then say, okay, I'll give you half price off, I'll give you a full price off or uh, whatever it happens to be. Then uh, you would leave it as manually entered and they would actually put in what the dollar value is that they're going to discount off the, the item. Now you'll notice on percent off and amount off, I come up with these uh, three uh, boxes over on the right hand side. Now the first one shows percent off and you put in whatever the value of that is going to be. So 10% off, I put 10 in there and that's going to be 10% off. Very self-explanatory. Now I also have percent discount B and percent discount C. Why the heck would I have that? Well one of the things you can do within Pixel Point is that you can adjust your coupons to uh, be sensitive to whatever your pricing level is at the moment. Now, for example, let's say I have happy hour. Now, normally this is 10% off any beer, let's say. And so I buy a beer, and the price of a beer is $4. Here's my 10% off coupon. So that's $4 minus 40 cents, which is $3.60 for a, a beer. Um, but now, right now, I, I am actually in happy hour. Now, in happy hour, my prices are reduced, and I set that up elsewhere on the system. But that being said, when you're working with pricing levels and so on, I may now have a price level B, so that it's $4 for a beer on regular hours, but it's $3 for a beer during happy hour. Now, if that is the case, that would be a price level B. And so this is price level A, B, and price level C as well. So we allow you to work with those three the three main ones. We've never seen anyone who needed all 10 uh, when it came to adjusting coupons and so on. But in that in that case, anyway, uh, let's say I am kicked over to price level B, which is my happy hour. And if that is the case, then I may not want to offer 10% off an already discounted beer. But they do want to use that, that coupon nonetheless. So you know what I can do is I can say, okay, it'll be 10% off if it's regular price time. But if we're in happy hour, I'm going to reduce that to six percent. Okay, so your ten percent off is now six percent if you're buying it during happy hour, and so you can kind of compensate for things that way. And if I have a happy happy hour where my beer is reduced even further, then I may say, okay, I will take the ten percent coupon, but it's only going to be worth four percent during happy happy hour. And so this way, when you're working with the price levels, you can adjust the values of your coupons and discounts to uh, to compensate for already discounted things uh, using price levels. Okay, coming down, and you can do that with for amount as well. All right, coming down below that, <coughs> excuse me, we have uh, minimum. And in here, I can put in a, a minimum criteria in order to uh, honor this, this, uh, this coupon. So the first thing we have here is quantity. All right, so within this, I can say, for example, that I want to uh, calculate uh, for the quantity, you must have a minimum of three beer in order to use uh, the, the coupon on this. Okay, so you can set that. Also, we have increment and volume as well. Um, you're you're going to find as we get into other things uh, further on within this that uh, there are some other variations we can use with this as well where things, for example, incrementation. If I order three of this, I get a certain discount. If I order five of these, I get another discount. If I order eight of these, I get another discount. And, and that's one of the newer things we've added into Pixel Point in terms of discounting and coupons and so on like that. That being said, uh, when you're working with incrementations uh, like that, then, then this uh, minimum criteria can actually be adjusted for that as well when calculating uh, 
the, this whole thing. Also, volume discounts as well, or, or volume purchases. Um, if it is going to be something where you're purchasing a, a, a group of things, let's say, for example, like a catering type environment, that's very common, uh, where I've got, you know, I want 200 sandwiches, or I want, you know, 50 pizzas, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, when you're working in large volumes like that, you can set this up with a minimum volume criteria for that as well. And then underneath that, we also have a price, and in here, a minimum price. So the minimum price on the check, uh, and this does apply to the check, uh, must be, um, for example, uh, no, no, it's not check, I'm sorry, it's actually the purchase of this item. So if I'm, I may purchase one, two, or three of these, but it, you need at least, uh, let's say, $10 worth of this item on the check in order to honor the 10% off discount. Uh, you see that quite often, you know, a minimum purchase of whatever happens to be, and then you can, uh, it will honor the discount. So if that's the case, you can set up the minimum cri price criteria for this as well. And this does apply to everything that applies to this coupon, not the entire check. Sorry about that. Okay, coming over to the right-hand side, we've got all these other little selections here. The first grouping up here has to do with um, the scope of applying this. Uh, so the first one here is applies to certain categories. Now this is report categories. <clears throat> uh, just before I continue on, let's just talk about the theory of how, how we group our things together. First of all, at the top end we have summary groups. And summary groups are things like food, bar, beverage, very basic general grouping of menu items on the system. So if I run a summary group report, I want to see what my food sales were. That would be a summary group report. Now, if I want to break it down further, which you would, uh, then I can say, all right, within my food items, I want to break it out so I've got my soups and salads, and then I've got my chicken items, my grill items, and so on like that. And that is a report category. All right, a uh, dollar only does it apply to, all right, uh, just let me maximize on this window a little bit. Okay. Dollar only, does it apply uh, also to percent? I'm guessing you're referring to this stuff over here. More often than not, it is dollar only. Uh, when it comes to percentage, we see when you get into dealing with percentages, sorry for deviating, folks, just a moment here. When you're dealing with percentages on things, we do tend to stress towards dollar value because you're working with proper calculations in that case. When you get into things such as percentages, such as, uh, um, you know, give me, give me all of these items and give me 10% off, but... Uh, you know, I'm just going to confuse it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So you can do a manual percent. And no, you can't do a manual percent uh, on a discount uh, because it does get a little ambiguous, especially when you're working with multiple tax levels. So you've got to bear in mind as well that we've got taxes to roll into all this stuff as well, and this is where calculations can get really hairy. And then on top of that, then they're, when they're doing uh, things such as splitting checks as well, uh, it can turn into a real mess. So frankly, that's that's an area that we chose to uh, just kind of leave out of the equation altogether. All right. Sorry for the, the tangent there, folks. Okay, so on this, uh, when you're working with report categories, report category is a further breakdown of a summary group. So I got my soups and salads, and I got my grill items, and I got my desserts and kids and so on like that. Those are all report categories. Now, in this particular case, uh, when I'm setting this up, I want 10% off everything within one of these report categories. And in this, I can select up my report categories and say, okay, apply it to beer. Okay, so now I've set this up. This is 10% off any beer item. Okay, so you can, you can do it that way, where as, as long as the item is flagged as a beer on the section, then it will honor this. But if I choose a salad, no, it won't, because that's not within the beer report category. The next one down here is applies to all categories. You select on this and applies to everything on the check. Pretty self-explanatory. The next one is applies to a product. So here you're working with a specific product or a specific menu item on the system. So 10% off your banana split. Okay. So now I've just made this so it is product specific. So if, it's, if you've got a banana split on there, then you can use this coupon. If not, then if you don't have a banana split, then you can't use it applies to a selected product. If I choose on this, then that means I have to actually choose the item and then apply the discount. So again, coming back to that manager's comp, for example, where today it was lasagna, tomorrow it will be, you know, the guy's spaghetti was, was cold or something like that. Uh, then you can, what the system will do is, is it will prompt you to select the item. You must choose the item before applying the coupon. 
and applies to certain products being a group of products or a group of menu items. So in this case, then, I can select on this. I can say on a per menu item basis that I want to apply it to the banana split and to the Amstel beer and to a Caesar salad. Okay, so if you have any of those completely unrelated items on the system, this 10% off can apply to a banana split, a beer, and or a uh, Caesar salad. And you can choose it that way. But along with this as well, you can put in a secondary requirement for this, but requires something else. Okay, so for example, you can have 10% off your beer, but uh, you must have um, a grill item on the check, for example. So you order a, ma a main course thing, then you've got that in there. So if you know, for every dinner you order, you get 10% off your beer, something of that <laughs> nature. You can, you can get pretty weird about it. Uh, but anyway, that gives you an idea of, of how you can put in some criteria for that. In this case, I'll just say it applies to all categories, 10% off the whole check. All right, coming down below that, we have uh, some additional criteria you can select within here. The first one is coupon is a two-for-one coupon, okay, BOGO. Buy one, get one free, or get one half price, or get one with a 10% off. So I can select on this, in which case then, <coughs> up above, if I did have a specific item, let's say the banana split, all right, I'll come back to Mr. Banana Split. Okay, so 10% off a banana split. Coupon is a two for one. So basically, I have to order a banana split to get 10% off the second one. Now, apply to lowest price items first. Okay, um, let's say instead of being a banana split, it was on a banquet burger. Okay, so we have three types of burgers. I have a hamburger, self-explanatory. I have a cheeseburger. It's a hamburger, but I've added on a slice of cheese. And I have a banquet burger, which is a hamburger with a slice of cheese and bacon. Okay, and the, the prices of these are $2, $3, and $4, uh, respectively. Okay, now, this applies to 10% off, uh, or buy one, get one half price, let's say, or buy one, get one free, or something like that. Uh, for banquet burger. So you buy one banquet burger, get another one half price. Now, um, the problem is that three of us go out and we, we place our order. One person orders a hamburger, the second person orders a cheeseburger, the third person orders a banquet burger, they present the coupon. They don't want an, uh, to purchase for half price an additional banquet burger, but they want to use this coupon. So what the system will do is that by default, it will look to the next um, if it doesn't find anything that is priced exactly the same as the bank of burger uh, that applies to this within that criteria, then it will apply the next closest thing, which in this case would be the cheeseburger. Uh, now, the problem is that management says, no, 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 no. If they do that, I don't want to discount the, the cheeseburger. I want to discount the hamburger. That's the lowest price item of the three that could be applied to this. So if that is the case, then I can select on applies to lowest price items first. In that case, then it'll take a look at comparison of those and say, okay, so I'm going to take 10% off the hamburger as opposed to the cheeseburger. There's a lot to that, isn't there? <laughs> okay, the next thing we have down here is one per check maximum. So basically, if I have a check with all these hamburgers or banana splits or whatever it happens to be on here, actually, I'm just going to change this over to a hamburger. Uh, just. home burger, good enough. Okay, so there we have it on, on a hamburger, and I'll just talk about hamburgers that way. Okay, so the next thing we have here is one per check maximum. <clears throat> so if I select on that, then basically you can apply only one of these coupons to a check. If I have a fistful of these coupons and, they, and this is not checked, then that means I can order my hamburger, okay, here's 10% off, here's another 10%, and here's another 10%, so now you got 30% off. If you want to honor it that way, the system will allow you to do that. If you want to restrict it so you can only use one of them once, then you can uh, put in the check that little box, in which case then I can only accept one 10% off coupon per check. Allow other category coupons and allow other product coupons. Now this means that I can honor um, other coupons that may be available or other discounts that may be available in the system that pertain to other items. So for example, I get 10% off my home burger, for example, but also here's a coupon for uh, buy one, get one salad. And then here is another coupon for 20% off a piece of pie. So if I want to order a salad and a piece of pie, for example, on the check, and I want to be able to use, allow them to use those other non-related coupons, 
then I can select on these as well, in which case then the system will allow for the application of other coupons onto, this, onto the system. If you leave them unchecked like that, then basically one coupon, one check, that's it. Apply only once if multiple products are found. All right, now if this is left unchecked, then here's my 10% off uh, a home burger. Okay, so I will order five home burgers on this, on this uh, check. Here's my 10% off. It doesn't stipulate that it's only for one, so you know, 10% you, off each one of these. Or you can select on this so that apply only once if multiple products are found. So if I have multiple hamburgers, for example, on this check, I can only take 10% off one of those hamburgers as opposed to 10% off each of those hamburgers. Coming over to the right-hand side, auto-calculate. Now, what this does is that it will allow a recalculation of the discount based on stuff that has been ordered after the fact. So for example, I've got this, this, uh, this order up on the screen, and I order a hamburger and stuff, stuff, stuff. And then here's my, my coupon for that. So I apply the discount to it. OK, 10% off the, the hamburger. Now, maybe because we're in table service or because they've presented this and I applied it, and then they ordered additional things, whatever the case, uh, they add on another hamburger after the fact. Well, the way it is without this check is that the system will say, all right, here's your hamburger, 10% off, boom, there you go, and it's done. And then you order another hamburger or another five hamburgers, and it will not apply. But if I do an auto-calculate, auto then what it will do is that every time you add on something that could be applied to it, the, the discount will recalculate itself uh, to, and adjust itself within the contents of the check as subsequent items are ordered after applying the coupon. Auto apply. Be careful with this, but it is a nifty little thing. Uh, for example, um, if I order two hamburgers, get a third one free. All right. So you know what? This is a discount. I'm just offering. You know, you don't need to present a coupon for it or anything. It's just a discount. So if that's the case, people are coming up and they say, "Okay, I'll have a hamburger, fries, and a drink, and I'll have a hamburger and a salad and a tea, and I'll have a hamburger and a pop and a and a something else, whatever it happens to be." Uh, now, what the system will do is that it will go in and it, it can, uh, if you have this checked, it can automatically apply this discount if the criteria is met. Okay, so if that being the, the case, then uh, what will happen is that it will automatically apply this 10% off to that hamburger or group of hamburgers or something like that. Because the criteria was met, you don't have to physically go in and apply the discount itself. Just bear in mind, though, a little word of caution on this, is that if you have other things that can be applied to it, I may have like four or five of these coupons that are on the system that are set to auto-apply. And you may find that when you get into placing an order on the system, your coupon, you're, you're discounting the crap out of this thing, and uh, OK, we'll discount this, and then OK, we'll discount that, and discount this, and we didn't think about that when we thought the whole thing. And it can be, it can be a real mess. So be very careful and use this sparingly that you can really control in terms of the auto application or the, the yeah the auto application of, uh, of discounts to checks as well okay because you don't want one overlapping on another and you suddenly find that yeah you get 10% off your home burger but then you get 20% off your entire meal on top of that you know which includes that home burger so you discount it on a discount also we have auto remove as well <clears throat> one of the things I'm going to be showing you in the next screen uh, after I, I finish off this, this particular application here is where you can have uh, kind of a migration of, of discounts, okay? And I kind of leaned towards that uh, when I was dealing with stuff over here on the, uh, on the incrementation. And so, for example, if, I, if there is some form of incrementing from one discount to another, then you may want to actually remove the old discount because the new discount is being applied to it. And so that's where auto remove can actually be applied on there. So that if I order one hamburger, I get 10% off. If I order three hamburgers, I get 20% off. If I order five hamburgers, I get 50% off. Now, if that's the case, then you may want to remove the the 10 percent and then the 15 percent and then the whatever percent. So on this, it can automatically remove, remove that. Apply to members only. If I select on this, that means that I must have a member applied onto the check before it can, uh, it can honor this discount. And that being, <coughs> excuse me, that being said, I can make this uh, so that uh, it can be 
if, if for, for example, let's say I'm doing like a, a client retention program, and you can actually accumulate points. For every hamburger I order, I get 10 10 percent, or I get uh, 10 points. And then when I get to 100 points, I can redeem those 100 points and have a discount set up within here for uh, redemption for a free hamburger or a uh, T-shirt or or something like that, you know, whatever it's going to be. But I can restrict it so that this is only available to members, and I must have a member apply to the check in order for it to be uh, applicable. If there's no member on the check, it won't work. But within that as well, you'll notice down here I've got that client points thing I was just mentioning about. Now let's talk about this section down here. Um, one of the things we can do within the system is that the more often you come in, the more often you order stuff, the system can actually track that and give you rewards for it. This is very common throughout all restaurants now. And Pixel Point does this as well. And that being said, let's say, uh, for example, for every home burger I get 10 points, like I said. Then what you can do is when they decide to redeem those points, then using these down here, first of all, I can say client points coupon. I can select on this, and this is where I'm going to say, all right, you will get a coupon for 10% off anything on the check or something like that, or 10% off a, a hamburger. So on here, I can say it's going to cost you 100 points to do that. All right, so within the system, and we come and haven't come to members and stuff yet, I'll, we'll be coming to that in, the, in later sessions. But I can have, for example, my hamburger, 10 points, and I can have Scott the member, for example, and I've got my I've got you know 200 points sitting that I've accumulated within my orders over a period of time, and so I can take 100 of those points and I can redeem them for a discount on a hamburger, for example. In which case, then I can apply that. Also, we've got auto order item. It may be, it may not be a hamburger. I may want to redeem it for a promotional item like uh, the restaurant T-shirt with a logo on it, or maybe a hat or a keychain or something like that. In which case, then I can be product specific and I can go in and say I get you know a free eight ounce glass of beer or something like that. I can so I can redeem this and automatically give me uh, my promotional item of an eight ounce glass of beer. So if that's the case, you can select on that, and that will allow you to to order things like that. We've actually had um, that whole points retention thing set up for some pretty large uh, rewards uh, based on uh, on on uh, some some clients uh, usage on the system things like uh, like watches for example and trips and, and so on like that of course the the points accumulation had to be pretty extreme for that as well but that being said uh, yeah the, there's there's uh, places out there with with pretty high-end clients that uh, come in and they order some expensive stuff and they accumulate some big points and over a period of time they can work up and and get some pretty nifty uh, prizes as well all right, so that's all the main guts on the coupon main tab. Now the next one over is on the advanced tab. And let's just take a look at the stuff we've got within this. First of all, we've got the active date range. Now in here, you can actually program in a future date for this and put in an expiry date as well. So that being the case, then I can set up a coupon that is going to come into effect next month. And at the end of the month, then it will be removed from the system automatically. And so that's what Active Date Range does. Take a look here. Notice that it'll take you right up to January 1st, the year 6,000. So we are Y6K compliant. You can put in all kinds of stuff, and we're good up until the year 6,000. And then by then, hopefully, we'll have a patch. OK, the next thing down underneath that is accounting code. All right, so within here, a general ledger account number, just for reporting purposes, uh, you can put in some kind of account number for that pertaining to this given discount. Over on the right-hand side, we have schedule. Now, schedule applies to this stuff over here. Remember, we were talking about that. So, coming into schedule, on here, here's my schedule for uh, my establishment. And in here, let's uh, let's say that we want it to kick over. Here, let's come back to this. All right, we're going to kick over to discount B, which would be six percent, and discount C, which would be four percent, whenever happy and happy happy hour are. So in here, I would say, for example, that my happy hour is, let's say, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, Monday to Friday. So I just kind of click and drag across uh, for those bars, and I'll just select on B. So there's my happy hour right there. And my happy, happy hour, which is price level C, will say will be after that, and it will be for those hours there, and uh, that will be Monday to Friday as well. Now, if I'm open past midnight, bear in mind that that also takes me into beginning of the following day, in which case then I'm up to these hours here. Now, because let's say Friday night 
after midnight is now the beginning of Saturday. So I have to take into account that square right there. So when I'm doing this, let's say it's open until two o'clock, you know, up till two o'clock in the morning. So I'll, oh, messed up on my part. There we go. And then from here, I'll select on like that. Okay, so this way, Monday night after midnight, you're now into Tuesday. And then Friday night after midnight, you're now into Saturday. So just kind of bear that in mind. Whenever you're doing any kind of scheduling in this system, that when you are carrying into uh, the following day, or when you are carrying past midnight, you are walking into the following day, and that's how you schedule it that way. Okay? But that being said, there's my happy and happy hour right there. Also, I may not want this uh, coupon to be present at all, so, you know, to not be available. So, for example, uh, within here, not even present. So take it out of the equation altogether. There you go. All right, so I'll just save that, and now I just set up scheduling for my 10% off coupon. The next thing we have here is barcode. Okay, this is where you, if you have, for example, an establishment, let's say like a pizza place, for example, and they're part of a much larger chain. Now, this uh, chain of pizzerias, they have uh, national uh, coupons, they may have statewide coupons, and they may have local coupons that they create as well. So for a pizzeria or a sub place or something like that, you may find that they've got maybe like 20, 30 different discount coupons uh, being printed in a variety of different publications. One quick and easy way to be able to retrieve the right, run, the right one as opposed to risking applying the wrong one or taking 20 minutes to find the right one just make sure that the, the coupons are printed with a barcode. If they are, put in the UPC code within here. So this way, all you have to do is just scan uh, the barcode, and it will apply the discount automatically. Coming over to the right-hand side, depending on your local tax laws, you may need to take into account whether to include or exclude taxes within the calculation of this coupon. If that is the case, over here, deduct the taxes. Okay, So for example, it may be 100% off any plate of spaghetti, but you pay the tax on it at least. So that's something that may need to, to take into account. Check with your local tax laws and see, see what can be included and excluded within discounting uh, to make sure that's properly applied within there. If you're using the web-based ordering system, which is Web2Go, then you can actually select on Enable on Web, in which case then I will honor this for web-based orders as well. And if that is the case, over here we have what's referred to as a marketing code. And in the, the, in the system, you can actually enter in a discount code. And if it, it, so, for example, if you have you know, a, a discount in the paper and uh, it shows, okay, this is good for anything, including web-based ordering, then you just kind of clip that out, and it'll ask on within the website, then you can say, okay, marketing code 123, I'll put in 123, here it is, here. And so it will apply this remotely. You just have to make sure that you present it later on, which is within here requires voucher. We'll talk about that in a second. Also down here as well, coupon description. Okay, so within here, uh, web to go coupon for 10% off any slice of apple pie, for example. Whatever it happens to be applicable to, then that can show up within there. And this will also be reflected across within the web to go system when applied. All right, coming down to requires voucher. So within this, if you do physically require a piece of paper to be presented when you're applying this 10% off discount, then you can uh, select on that and uh, so that the system will actually bring up a, a bulletin message saying, you know, requires voucher for this to, to be accepted. And uh, then you, put, you select on yes, and boom, it moves on from there. If you select on no, they don't have the voucher, then it can't honor it. Uh, also part of a coupon group as well. Now, I haven't talked about groups yet. That's going to be one of the next things I'm going to discuss. And in here, uh, then you would select on which particular grouping it applies to. We'll talk about that in just a minute. The last thing I've got within here is a custom DLL. If for any reason there's any kind of funky laws or whatever that happens to be applied uh, to this particular uh, coupon outside of the realm of what we've just applied within here, then we can apply a custom DLL for this as well to make it work the way it needs to work. Uh, basically, look at it this way. If you have some kind of a discount that needs to be applied and it doesn't fit within any of the criteria of what we got here, you know, we, it needs to be tweaked in order to work with whatever the, it happens to be, and this is usually for international countries, uh, then we can apply a DLL for that. And there may be a charge you know, to create that DLL, but then you can apply it and it'll work fine. The next thing we have here is coupon groups. 
Now this is where you can actually group coupons together to migrate from one to another. This is the, increment th the incrementation thing I was talking about. So let's take a look at a, an example of what I've got here. I've got here, for example, uh, quantity purchases. I just call, call this particular grouping. And within this, I gave it a security level and a revenue center. That's easy enough. Now down below, I've got uh, kind of an idea, give you a kind of idea of how this all works together here. So for example, I've got a coupon set up for three items for $9.99, five for $12.99, seven for $15.99. Now, I wanna, before I continue on further with this, I'm just gonna jump back just so we can just take a, a quick orientation on these particular coupons. Okay, so here's three, three for $9.99. And on here, I have set within this report categories. Of course, I didn't set up anything in here. So that that kind of makes it bad. Uh, all right, let's say desserts. Actually, I wouldn't even want to do that. I would probably do it on a specific product. Well, no, you could do it on, all right, we'll, we'll do it on this. Applies to a product, and on here, I would have my banana split. Okay, so let's try it on that. So if I purchase three banana splits, I get this discount for $9.99. And on this, I can set it up to automatically apply if, if need be as well. And if I come up to uh, five for twelve ninety nine, then again, we'll change that and make that the banana split again. Okay, so this way it'll migrate from one to the next. And I, of course, I haven't programmed all this stuff properly on here, but I can have it so that you can apply this. And then also on this as well, auto calculate, uh, maybe auto remove as as well within that, so that if you come up to one take this and then you know dump off the previous one when it migrates up to a, a higher one. So coming back here now to my coupon group, so let's say it's banana splits. I can now group these all together so what will happen is that as I go about ordering on the system and I've got it, my coupon set up this way, it may auto apply, then I order, okay what would you like? Well I'd like this, this and a banana split and that, that and two more banana splits, okay then the three ninety nine will kick in or three for 99 will kick in. And then uh, I'll have a couple of those and throw in two more banana splits. Okay, we're up to 5.99 now. And a whole bunch of those and then give me four more banana splits, in which case we're up to seven of those now for 15.99. So the system will actually change from nine to 12 to 15 automatically on this. And within it, it can remove off the old ones so that you're now, it's just applying the one that's most applicable to the quantity that's, per, that's uh, applied within there. And one thing that's important before I continue on as well, make sure these are in proper migration order in order for the calculation to figure out properly. That's why we have move up and move down on here. It's because if I had, for example, $7.99 at the top and then three ninety uh, uh three for nine ninety nine underneath that, it'll mess up the whole figure. The system will have a problem trying to figure out the migration of calculation. So always start from smallest and go to largest uh, when you're you're setting this up. Coming over to the advanced tab, we also have, for example, the active date range, self-explanatory barcode, I already talked about that, and also within here, schedule as well. So we can set up the scheduling just as we did uh, with the other one, in, but this way it pertains to all of these coupons and the application of this grouping of coupons uh, within the schedule there. Coming down below that, we have options. First of all, we have apply to members only, self-explanatory, basically you select on this, you gotta have a member on the check to do it. Auto calculate, okay, and auto apply, okay. So within there, you can do this on this strictly on this grouping. So this way, I can offer these individual coupons as it is, or I can set it up for exclusively for this grouping. How to figure all this out, and when doing this as well, client points coupons. So I want to may do a client retention program so that you can migrate from one to the next to the next, and then use that bottom line one. But you may need to redeem some points in order to do it. And so that's the wonderful world of coupons. The next thing we have down here is receipt setup. Now, there's two areas where you can create your receipt headers and footers in the system. Uh, the first one and the most logical one is this section right here under general setup because whatever you set within here will apply to all stations on the system. However, <coughs> you can override this programming on a per station basis by going into station setup because the last tab we have here is receipt set up and on here I can select on this and I can program the header and footer on a per station basis. The, the time you would want to do this is when you're working let's say with multiple revenue centers where one place is called family restaurant and the next one is called Joe's 
disk attack or something like that. In which case you're working with multiple revenue centers and you want different headers, for example, for these places. Uh, but they're all working on this, the same POS system. So that would be the one time that you would want to do this. But other than that, don't use this one. Use the, the one in general setup. The reason for this as well is that if I add on additional stations later on, they will all inherit this particular header. Uh, you, unless, of course, you decide to override that when you're setting up each one of those. Now, it's important as well that you do actually set up this stuff, because if you don't, then it's going to say your your bar and grill or something like that and, and some bogus address that we put in by default on the system. Um, so that if you print it off a check, it'll, they'll look and, hey, that's not our restaurant, that's the generic one. You know, So you do need to make sure that you go in and actually program this. So very important, make sure you do it. Now, along with this, we have basically our text that shows up in here. Let's say, for example, Pixel Point Restaurant is what I've got sitting on this one here. And on this, I have some symbols off the left on left hand side. So let's just take a look at what we've got here. The little roof icon that's referred to as a circumflex. And from with here, we uh, we have, I think that's what it's called. Uh, we have all these different symbols for it. So we have the W for wide print. Okay. So when you're working with your printers, if you want it to show up in a in a larger font, a wide print, uh, then you can use the W for that. Uh, your regular default font uh, sizing for that will show up in a normal print. R for red print, so if you're working with ribbon printers, for example, black and red, then if you want to show up with a, a red text, then you can put in the R before that, such as here, daily specials. There's the R for red, W for wide, and we have C here, which is for center on the line as well. So it will center it uh, within your 40 column print. Next we have uh, the uh, G, which is for print logo. Now print logo is basically the image that you have uploaded into your printer. Uh, if it's a nice logo of uh, the establishment or a picture of the place or whatever it happens to be, and your printer has that graphic capability to print off that given image, then you can use the circumflex G for that. Now, where you would find that particular logo, it comes back here into network printer setup. Oh, nope, not network printer setup into printer code setup. And on here, we have this thing that says print logo. And in here, you put in whatever the, the print string would be for that, uh, for that given printer. And that would be indicated within the, the manual for that printer. And you would put in that code. And with that in there, then you can go back into this. And within here, we can put in, for example, there and G. OK. And that's all you would do when you're applying that in there as well. Do not try to center it because that'll just skew it all over the place. Make sure it's it's left justified. And don't try to do any other stuff. Just put in the, the, the circumflex G, boom, you're ready to go with that. We also have one O for order number. So if I put in that, what it's going to do is take the last three digits of the transaction number and put them in a large, uh, large font and put that right within the header as well. So this is really good for like a, like a drive-in type place where now serving order number one, two, three, and because you would see the one, two, three showing up within there because the one, two, three is the last three digits of the transaction and the order number kind of pulls from that. Okay, so uh, that's what that applies to. And then we also have B as well for barcode. Okay, transaction barcode. It'll take the transaction number and convert that into a, a barcode layout, if your printer has that capability as well, just bear that in mind. In which case, then it will show that up on the header. So it, now, when you print off the receipt, for example, and then you have to take your receipt, let's say, to a cashier. Well, the cashier can look up your transaction somehow, you know, using the information on the system. Or if it's a really busy place, all they need to do is just scan the barcode that prints off on the header, and from there they retrieve your check and they can process you that way. So that's all the little bells and whistles that you can toss into that. The footer obviously shows up at the bottom of the check. Header shows up at the top of the check. We also have layout as well. If there's any form of custom layout that you need to provide on your uh, receipt uh, that you may want to include like some member information or an, a, a secondary tip line or whatever it happens to be like that, then you can actually go in and do some very custom programming on that. We have some examples of that within the MyPAR website, I believe. And uh, within there, you know, you can uh, pop in all this kind of stuff. And if also, you will find actually new variables as they're introduced within each uh, 
each uh, subsequent version as well. So like within, if you're checking you know, the new things that have come out for version 10, new things that came out for version 11, and so on, you would find one area in there of print varial, variables, in which case then we've got some new fields that we've added in that you can apply within these screens as well, and uh, you can customize your layout that way. And then finally, we have sort. Within here, when I want to print off my, my check or my receipt, how do I want the contents, the, the, the contents of the check uh, sorted? So within here, depending on my particular establishment, I may say, for example, by course and then by seat. So appetizer, seat one, two, three. Main course, one, two, three. Dessert, one, two, three. If I want my receipts to reflect that particular order, then I can do it that way. It's the same sorting function as what we do with our remote prints, which was way back when I was talking about setting up network printing. You can do that with your receipts as well, where you can adjust the order of these things uh, in this case, by group them by summary group, by product print priority, so these items first, these items second, or by uh, course, appetizer, main course, dessert, or by seating position, seat one, two, and three. And you can use any combinations of these things as well. Meal time. One of the nifty little things you can do with Pixel Point is that you can break off your sales based on a meal time. So for example, I want to see what my sales were for the breakfast period, and then for the lunch period, and then for the dinner period. And those periods of time are from this to that, whatever it happens to be. Now on here, you can actually set that up. We have a numeric value that you can apply to these. We have meal time reports that are available uh, within all of our reporting systems. Uh, that can reflect all this information. All you have to do is just change the, uh, the sequence of these to reflect a different numeric value. Ev by default, everything will show up as a one. Okay, so you have one meal time, boom, here you go, your sales were this for the day. Now if you were to run one of those meal time reports, I said for example within here, from six o'clock up until 11 o'clock, I want that to be my breakfast period. So I'm gonna change all of those time periods from a one to a two. So then within the mealtime report, it will show you that meal meal time period number two, which is your breakfast, um, had sales within this period of, of time. Now the sales that it pertains to is the closing time of the check, not the open time of the check. So for example, if I had a guy who came in and ordered a breakfast prior to six o'clock in the morning, uh, then that would show up within section number one. If he paid for it um, after six o'clock, then it would show up in two. If he paid for it before six o'clock, it would be one. So regardless of when he ordered it, it's a matter of when the, the check was actually closed. And that's what these numbers uh, represent within those time periods, is the actual sales that took place within that period. So again, going from breakfast into lunch, if he ordered a meal at, uh, at 10.55 and then paid for it at 11.15, uh, then the sale would be reflected within 11 o'clock being the lunch period as opposed to the breakfast period, even though he ordered it within the breakfast period. Now, that being said, you can have uh, anywhere from one up, till, up to nine that you can fit within this. However, take a look at this. It's on a per day basis because your meal times may vary from one day to the next. You know, and my, my breakfast, for example, my Sunday breakfast is from six until 11, but uh, on, my, on Monday, my breakfast period may be from 5 until 10 or something like that. So you can alter these on a per day basis, but within that as well, you can have up to nine different meal times that you can have reflected within any given day. Oh, I should also kind of just point out here before I continue on as well, just so you interpret the information correctly. So here's 6 o'clock. So this cell here represents 6 o'clock to 6.15, 6.15 to 6.30, 6.30 to 6.45 and 6.45 to 7 o'clock. Okay, coming down next, we have pay-in and pay-out reasons. <clears throat> now, a pay-in is money being submitted into your till that's outside of the realm of a transaction. A pay-out is money being removed from your till outside of the realm of a transaction. And if you are going to allow the establishment to do that, allow servers to be able to do that with their tills, then you need some form of record keeping in, ter in terms of determining why was that money brought in or, or taken out. Now, within the system, when you're doing an individual pay-in or pay-out, it will ask for a description and you can put something in there. But if you're doing like 30 or 40 of these within a day, uh, and then you run off your end of day report, you're gonna find a pretty extensive thing with everyone's different descriptions showing up in there. Not very practical. So what the system can do in, 
to, to help with this is rather than do the individual um, descriptions is that it will also prompt you to select a reason for this, which is something a little more generic that can then clump it into a certain, uh, met, uh, a certain accountability uh, as far as a pay-in or a payout and what it's being applied to. So you'll see here, for example, I've got one up on the screen that says general maintenance is one that I created. General maintenance being if it's anything like, you know, a service came in, let's say a guy came in and uh, he washed the windows for the uh, establishment. And uh, so he comes to you, says, okay, I cleaned your windows and here's my bill for $25.16. And if you have that money in the till and if you have permission to be able to pay him on the spot, then you can do a payout. You can say general maintenance and on there it'll say, for what? I'll say Joe's Windows Service. I'll type that into the system and then it'll pop open the drawer. You give him the $25.16 and you put his bill into your till. Boom, you're ready, you're ready to go. And that that payout is actually recorded in the system under, for example, general maintenance, because that's the one you selected. Uh, the reference number would be a, a general ledger account number for reporting purposes. And then within there, I've got this identified that is strictly for payouts, for example. Underneath this, also, when this one is being applied, when being general maintenance, also pop open the drawer so that you can pay the guy as well. You can determine uh, down below as to whether this given reason is going to be specifically for pay-ins, or for payouts, or applicable to either one of them, and along with this as well, whether to open the cash drawer or not. And then this is the, the line entry that would actually show up within the end of day report. So if you had three general maintenance ones within the day, one for the windows, one for the floors, one for the roof, or something like that, uh, then they would all be clumped under this one with the grand total for all three of those. And then from there, you can dig down further to see the individual transactions. All right, the next thing we have, let me see, is, yep, we're down to a billboard message setup. Okay, billboard. Remember if in the front end where you've got the billboard button, you select on that, you've got the three columns being um, specials of the day, desserts, and sold out items. And above that, we've got this big banner message that comes from management. And management, to put something in there, goes into this function within the back office. This is a message that's available to all staff, regardless of what your particular system interface is as well. So if you're clocking it out only, you still have access to billboards so that you can see this message. If you're a driver, you still have access to the, the billboard so that you can see this message. So this way, all staff will be able to see this message. And whatever you put within here will be uh, available to them within the billboard function. Banner message. If you're working with a poll display on the system, not so much um, a customer display, but just a, a simple little banner poll display, then this is the message that will marquee across or scroll across uh, the poll display when you are not in a transaction. So in here, welcome to PowerPixel.POS. You can have that in there, or you can change that to the name of the establishment. Thank you for coming, or welcome, or something like that. If it's one of those things where you you want to have more than one message on here, then all you have to do is just, when you come to the end of this line, press the Enter like this, and then type in your next message that will happen here. Now, what will happen is, as it marquees across, it will show, for example, welcome to par pixel point POS. And just as POS is starting to marquee off the screen, then the next line will come on being, SD space FSA blah 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 whatever it happens to be uh, that will be on there so that way it'll it'll migrate from one uh, display to another that way. Weather conditions. All right, you remember at the front end we also had uh, all the weather conditions that you can apply in the system as well as to. Uh, whether it was cloudy or rainy or sunny or something like that. And that would reflect across on your reports because it's important to show that um, when you're reporting how your outdoor dining sections uh, were for sales. Okay, so I got my patio. It was raining today, so my sales were down. It was sunny today, so my sales were up. So within here, we have all of the different conditions that you can apply within the system. And of course, they are weighted values as well because there is a report that you can get in the back end to kind of review in terms of the weather and how it was. Yes, it's a weather report. And then within there, it'll have weighted values and it will add them all up and tally and say, well, this summer was really good, last summer kind of sucked, and, and, and so on. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you can do with that. All right, now, after that, we have data miner client and report viewer. I'm actually going to put these two off. I'm going to just tuck them aside, and we're going to cover them within their own special presentation uh, maybe next week. And uh, 
the reason for that is because there, it's a little lengthy to get into all of those, and we'll talk specifically on reports as well. Uh, so we'll just kind of tuck those aside for the moment. Next thing we have here is system log. Now system log is basically a way of going in and just taking a look what's been going on within the back office, who's been in here tinkering around, and uh, what's happening with this. So if I go into system log, this is a log of all activity within uh, the back office. And on here, I can take a look for today, last 30 days, last 60 days, and within a given date range as well. And so on this, I've got all this information showing up within here. And we'll just take a look. All right, here's everything that's been happening for today. And on this, I can do filters as well. I want to filter by all employees or specific employees. So for example, there's supervisor, which is everything that I've been doing today. But if I went down to John, the employee, for example, he hasn't done anything in the back end. So I can, I can be very specific on that. Also, and specific actions as well in terms of what they've been doing within the back end. Uh, editing records, inserting records, deleting records, all kinds of stuff like that, then you can actually uh, have that isolated on there. So I want to see who's been doing whatever. And also you can be very specific on specific database tables as well, working with employees or payroll or, uh, or product information, promotional information, anything like, like that, uh, that that's been changed around. So I can be very specific so that when I'm looking through you know, a whole screen after screen of all these different things, I can do some filtering on these to look uh, to isolate on specific thing I'm looking for on this. Also on any one of these as well, if there's any detailed information that's available, then you can flip on over to detail. And it will give you detailed information in terms of what was done on this. So for example, on here, editing of the product number, a new value of 2048. It was done by supervisor at this date and this time. And uh, here's detailed information within the, the this is the, the actual uh, database record that we're looking at within here that pertains to that given item, that item change. And this is pulled out from, I'll, I'll tell you about database tables later on. Okay, but anyway, that, uh, that gives you an idea of what you can do within this. So it's basically just an, an auditing tool for all kinds of stuff that's been going on in the system. Backup now, I am going to put backup aside, and we'll talk about that on another presentation as well. And for today, we're going to finish off with this one here, which is Alert Manager. Now, Alert Manager is um, an additional utility that we've added into the system. And it's a great little thing because basically it's a self-reporting tool. Okay, so that means that the system actually can go in and it will report when certain conditions are, are met. And, uh, and it will report it in a manner uh, that you may want to be alerted on. So for example, I've got three set up within here right now. First of all, one I've got here is no sales alert. So basically, if there was like a no sale function, uh, at, at the end of the day, calculate through and, and tell me what I had for no sales on the system. Uh, transaction is out of range. OK, I'll just kind of explain on that. So here I've got, for example, I have a really large transaction that was done on the system. Hey, I may, I may want to be aware of this particular thing. Or here, uh, this is a good one as well. POS except, uh, exemption re uh, alert. OK, so I've got an exception error that showed up on the system. Now, this is really great, actually, for, uh, for, uh, for dealers. The reason being is that you can be notified whenever there's an exception error on any one of your client's POS systems. Uh, I'll show you in just a moment in, in terms of the nature of the reporting of it. But if they do get an error on this, their system, then you don't have to wait for them to call you up and say, hey, I got an error on, the, on our system and things aren't working right. Uh, you may actually get a text message on that. Oh, yes, I'm aware of that. It's error number one, two, three, and here's what we're going to do to fix it. So you can be right on top of things that way. Um, now, in terms of adding it, I'm, I'm going to actually create one right now. I'm going to go into Add Alert Schedule. And in here, I have a list of all of the different forms of alerts that you can do on the system. Now, over on the left-hand side, it defaults to all. Okay, So this is all of them. And I can be very specific in terms of if it's going to be an alert based on cash management operations, sales operations, system-related, labor-related, anything like that then you can select on any one of these, and it will break it out that way. Also, uh, any type as well uh, within here, if there's any that have been scheduled or you're using as plugins, the plugins are basically all of these different applications, uh, then you can, you can uh, isolate specifically on those as well. So these are the plugins, or, which is the default ones. And if there's any that have been scheduled, like the three that I've created, then they are showing up within here. So based on any of those types, just to filter things out, because you may have a whole bunch of these on the system. 
Okay, so within here, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create a sales type one. So I'm going to select on sales. Here's all the sales ones. I'm going to do um, just a sales alert. Okay, uh, and so I'll select on this particular one and I'll select on okay. Now what's going to happen is a wizard's going to show up on the screen, and on this wizard, I can walk through each one of these different things when setting this up with the criteria for it, and it will be added onto the system, and then this thing will just run in the background, and it will monitor this monitor the system to, until this criteria is met, and then alert whoever, whoever on it. So the first thing we have here is schedule. In here we have, how do I want to schedule this? On a, an interval of time, so you can choose on that on a specific day of the week. So calculate it you know, on specifically Wednesdays or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday to Friday or something like that. Or selective days of the month, in which case then you can choose a specific date as to when you want it done. So maybe I want this to figure out at the end of the month or on Wednesdays or every two hours. The next thing we have down here is specific times. When, when calculating out and applying this, uh, all day uh, being from time to time or only between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock or something. I can be very specific on this. Uh, then I, you know, this is a sales alert. So show me, you know, so, uh, well, we'll take a look at the criteria on config in just a moment here, but show me sales in excess of $100 between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock or any time during the day. Also, as far as business hours go, only during business hours or only during off hours, okay? So basically you've got your open and close hours, which we haven't come to. This is another... Uh, area in the system that we'll take a look at later, uh, or you can just say you know during business hours and off hours, anytime you know it, it happens to be. The next thing we have over here is config. Now the contents of the configuration tab will change uh, and be different based on whatever you have chosen for an alert. This particular one pertains to sales, so all this information in here is sales related. If it's a labor one, it'll be labor related, cash management, cash management related. So every one of these will have a different form of, of reporting and alerting on the system. But in here, what you can do is you can identify, for example, if the net sales or the gross sales of, a, of the transaction is greater than or less than uh, $100, for example. Uh, and this, the interval for calculation on this per hour, per day, per month, or within a meal period, uh, we'll say within the day, for example, and the period being current or previous, okay, being the, the current sh work shift or the previous work, work shift, for example. Then on this, do all that. Uh, also, we have it within here, uh, don't notice if, uh, if no sales as well. So based on what I've selected in here, this is grayed out, but if I chose the right ones, then this would be uh, applicable as well if it's no sales. Uh, that would have been prob probably less, I would think, yeah. Okay, the next thing we have here is, well, alert notice. On here, what is the title of this alert? Okay, so sales out of range alert, for example. And with whatever the message is going to be, put that within there. Uh, return details of that particular information to the sender it's going to go to. You can have that or just leave it off as if you want. Coming over to delivery now, the method of delivery for this particular alert. First of all, when you're setting up your employees, you can identify them as a manager on duty. I know I'm running short on time here, so I'll just kind of quickly skip on through this and we'll be done. So if your flag is a manager on duty, leave it as that and the manager on duty will then be notified via um, a broadcast message. So you can send over here as a broadcast message on the POS, boom, uh, it'll show up on their screen, hey, you got a thing that's over $100. Uh, send only to clocked in POS users, okay? So I've got several managers on duty or several people uh, and some are clocked in, some are not. So who needs to be notified? If they're clocked in, notify them. If they're not clocked in, don't worry about it. Over in the left-hand side, job position delivery list. And so within here, I can identify, for example, a specific job position, uh, all managers, for example. I can select on that, and you can do it that way. Also, if there's specific employees, I can select on this, and I can say, for example, Sarah. Okay, so notify uh, a specific employee uh, whoever it happens to be on the system about this. Also, down here, the form of delivery on this as well. I've got email and SMS. So email, you can send it out by email instead of a broadcast message as well. And also text messaging as well. Bear in mind there may be a cost, you know, if there's text messaging done, but within this, you can uh, notify them by that. To do that, you can either add in an individual thing, such as an email address or a phone number, or you can do a lookup uh, within their employee records, lookup email, for example. So there's Sarah. 
though. So there's her, her email address I've got within her employee record. And also I have her text, uh, her cell phone number as well. So in that case, then she will be notified by email and text message and also as a broadcast on the system as well that there was a, this particular sales alert uh, on the system. Reset the alert generation upon new open day. Self-explanatory. New day, I don't care about what happened yesterday. Minimum delay before the same condition can generate the alert again. So in here, uh, for example, if it's over $100 and there's no acknowledgement of it, then hey, $100, then oh, $100, then hey, $100, you know, can keep sending this thing. Or disable re-notification, which case then send it once, leave it alone, and that's it. And then finally we have about, and then within about we have within here. Just note pertaining to what this particular alert happens to be. And if you have a whole bunch of alerts, you can actually change around the icon that shows up for this as well. And uh, just save that. So I've got this new little uh, icon that shows up within there. And so that's how that handles it. And then within uh, alert, you take a look at this. And if there were any things that showed up, they will show up within here. And, uh, and you can be very specific in terms of which particular ones you want to review. Uh, that were already done. All right, and that's Alert Manager, and that is everything with the exception of the ones that I was going to skip over within the general pull-down menu. Okay, now I'm really short for time. I kind of went over time, so you know what? I've got time for maybe just a couple of questions. So at this time, if there's anyone who has uh, questions, I can take me about two or three, and then that's it. <laughs> we're going to be done. So this is your chance. Uh, type in something. Now let's see it now and make sure please it pertains to today's lesson, not something in general. Wow, I guess we did pretty good. Okay. Last chance on this. Okay. Uh, Mealtime setup. Can we do more than one at a time? I wish we could. Uh, you know what? I would love to do like a, a click and drag on those things, but it's one of those things that basically it did not. It, it just hasn't been evolved uh, that way. So no, it's on a per cell basis, just changed from a one to a two or one to a three or something like that. Feature requests. <laughs> Absolutely. Go for it, man. All right, last call. Okay, I think we're done for today then. Thank you very much for your uh, time and attendance, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'll see you this time next week, and uh, we'll continue on further, probably get into reports. I think we'll, we'll blast on through those. So we'll take a look at Data Miner and Report Viewer and uh, kind of jump on through those things, and I'll give you an idea of how they work as well. All right, so thank you very much for your uh, attention, and uh, you have a great day. Take care.